Hello everybody and welcome to Stella Live. Our special guest today is a great artist. He has been working extensively both for film and television and is the director of great titles such as Miami Vice, Stone Cold Dead, The Terror Experiment. Please welcome Mr. George Mandeluk. Hi George, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? I'm great. Tell us a bit about you. How did you choose to become a director? My father was a director of the Stanislavski Dance and Opera Ensemble back in Europe. He was Ukrainian. And um, I was born in Germany, and so he put on plays for the work camps and also for soldiers uh, during the war where he met my mother. And so when we came to Canada, I was six months old, I grew up in an artistic environment. I saw my father put on plays, and uh, uh, I went to movies. Uh, my mother used to take me to matinees, and so... Uh, I guess um, it was uh, it was in my family and in my blood. How much your parents' theater background has influenced you? Well, uh, quite a bit. Um, like I said, my father uh, staged Ukrainian plays in, in, in Toronto where I grew up, and he had uh, staged plays uh, in Europe, and that's how he met my mother. So more than looking at plays, I fell in love with movies. My parents took me to see... Uh, Limelight, Charlie Chaplin, I remember that. I remember going to see Westerns, you know, that they became part of my fabric. And then when television came around, uh, when we got a television, that we, my father and I used to watch a lot of Westerns. And so um, I, um, I remember seeing, um, and I'm dating myself a little bit, I remember seeing my, uh, uh, an Elvis Presley movie. And um, Sputnik was in the air, the Russians had put, and put a satellite in the air, and I'm coming out of the theater, and I thought, here's this poor guy from the South, and he's so charismatic, and uh, he was dirt poor when he started, and he became this huge star, and I looked up at the sky, and I saw, you know, the satellite flying around, and I said, you know what, this is a world of infinite opportunities, and I don't know what popped into my head, I said, I wanted to go and make movies, and I wanted to start in Canada, and then I wanted to move in Malibu, and then be a director, and that's what happened. How was the experience of directing your first feature film, Stone Cold Dead? Well, it was um, it was good. You know, we came in on budget and on schedule, and um, I worked with some really fine professional actors. I worked with Richard Crenna, who became a friend, and Richard Crenna had an illustrious career. He passed on, but he was in um, a, a TV series called The Real McCoys, and uh, uh, he also was in... Um, Oh, my goodness, what was the movie? Wait Until Dark, I think, with Audrey Hepburn. But he played a dead guy. And then later on, he was, uh, he was in Body Heat. He played the husband of um, Kathleen Turner. And he was uh, an actor that had been born. He was Italian in background, northern from northern Italy. And he, uh, he grew up in Los Angeles. His parents had a hotel. And he was full of stories. He, he knew Frank Sinatra and remembered... Um, you know, seeing Frank Sinatra and had a recording of one of Frank Sinatra's earliest uh, concerts where uh, the Bobby Soxers, when they introduced him on radio, which was his radio show, but they introduced him and he played this geeky guy and uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't hear anything for about two minutes because the rustling of the, the bracelets of the girls clapping when Frank was introduced uh, just drowned at everything else. So he was full of stories and he was from old Hollywood. And so, and then I, and then he, and then, uh, Paul Paul Williams, the songwriter, was also in the movie, and he also was in a, a classic sort of horror sci-fi movie called um, Phantom of the Paradise, which was kind of a rock and roll opera riff on um, uh, uh, Phantom of the Paradise. And so, you know, I kind of jumped in working with really good actors, so it was a wonderful experience. And I always liked thrillers, and I've done a lot of thrillers since then. Your first visual shot in the USA was The Kidnapping of the President, in which actors like Ava Gardner, William Shatner, Van Johnson, and Hal Holbrook were starring. How was for you to direct such an amazing cast? Well, it was shot both in Toronto and in Hollywood, and it was shot at the old uh, Selznick lot where they shot Gone with the Wind. So again, I kind of experienced mm -hmm. Hollywood working not only with Ava Gardner, who was a you know, legend, 
uh, but also with uh, her hairstylist called Sidney Gilleroff. If you look Sid, up, up Sidney Gilleroff, he was from uh, Montreal and uh, was a very, very classy, sophisticated judge who became a friend. And he had done the hair of Marilyn Monroe, Kim Novak, Claudette Colbert. And uh, I realized early on that sort of difference between the old legends, don't want to say old, but legends of the time, and also the current actors that were coming up, like Bill Shatner and, and Hal Holbrook, in my in my uh, interview that I have on my on my blog on my website, uh, georgemendeluck.com, I talked about how when Ava Gardner used to uh, finish a take, she would look at me. I thought she was looking at me, but really she was looking at Sydney sitting behind me, and she was really looking for Sydney for approval, not really for me. But uh, she was very respectful and needed direction. And I was kind of young. I think I let her overact a bit. Um, so I was a little in awe of her. But working with um, Hal Holbrook and uh, Bill, Bill Shatner was a little different because as a director, I think you have to learn how to adjust to certain performers. You're either going to be a father figure, which I wasn't to Ava Gardner, uh, or a friend, uh, which I was to Bill Shatner um, or, uh, or, or Hal Holbrook or uh, consummate and and the uh, emphasis on is on unconsummated, and so with um, with uh, Bill Shatner, it was much more of a collab. A lot to say about his scenes and how they were re- rewritten because he had a, himself and also um, of of his character, the Secret Service man. And then Hal Holbrook was interesting too. You know, he didn't need a lot of direction, and I realized that very early on in my career. Some actors don't. I went up to Hal and I, after a take, which which was the first scene where he played the president of the United States, and I said. You know, could you just give me a little more? You know, I, I just need you to be a little more in authority, a little more presidential. And he looked at me and he said, take a look at the dailies in the morning and tell me if I'm, if I'm presidential or not. And I thought, wow, okay. So I looked at the dailies in the morning and he was very presidential. I said very little to him after that. You have been working extensively for TV series and TV movies as well. Just to mention some titles, Miami Vice, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Highlander, Secret Lives, and 12 Hours to Live. Could you tell us a bit more about this? Well, Miami Vice I work on because it's probably one of the most legendary series uh, in television. Certainly, you know, it was voted one of the top 50 uh, series in television. So here I was um, coming from uh, Canada to direct. Um, well, actually, I was living in Malibu at the time, but I was a Canadian director, and I had, you know, not directed American television before. And so this is my first opportunity, and it was just, you know, phenomenal. Barbara Streisand was, uh, uh, at that time, uh, in a relationship with, with Don Johnson. So uh, Don Johnson and, and uh, Philip Thomas were um, on the cover of uh, Time magazine. So it was a very high-profile show. And I had always loved music, and I thought music was very important in film. And, you know... That was basically at that time a cop show, the first cop show of the MTV generation. So music was essential, you know, with Phil Collins and I directed Sheena Eason at the time where she got shot on stage. She was playing Sonny um, Sonny Crockett's wife and uh, that episode was called uh, Deliver Us From Evil, which, you know, Sonny uh, Sonny shot the bad guy that killed her. And so um, it was a very kind of historic moment in the series. Uh, Um... So that was the Miami Vice. Uh, the Highlander was interesting because it was kind of a cult situation, and I ended up doing also the female Highlander, which was the Raven. So that was uh, that was quite something else. It was I shot in Paris and also in Toronto. So working and living in Paris was an experience, and uh, there they in Europe and in France they treat directors a little, little, little differently. So a series in Paris was much, was much more like being a director on a feature film. You were much more involved. You were less as a guest. And um, doing Movies of the Week for the Lifetime channel uh, has been very gratifying as well because uh, I like working with uh, women and I like working with uh, um, actresses that, uh, that um, you know, are, have, have accomplished uh, things and some that are just coming up. So uh, I guess I'm a bit of a diva director, and um, I enjoy working with women. So I've had an opportunity to work with Ann Archer and some other women as well for those movies of the week, because usually they're women in jeopardy. Thrillers. Sometimes, sometimes some romantic comedies, because I like comedy too. Um, I've, I've kind of tried to fashion my career, and I've been fortunate where I, you know, directors as actors sometimes get 
typecast, and I really don't um, want to be typecast, so I've tried different genres, and I've been fortunate enough to direct everything from westerns to comedy to thrillers to children's stories to Christmas films, etc. Because I think a director is a storyteller, and so, uh, as long as the story is interesting, that's what I'm drawn to. Along your career, you have been shooting in several countries. How is to work in a different environment? I love it. It's a challenge, you know. Um, it's, again, it keeps you fresh and on your toes. I mean, basically, the filmmaking experience is the filmmaking experience. You have camera, you have actors, you have to prepare. You have to know what the story is, what the theme is, and so you go in that way. But um, it's always interesting because... Um, You get stimulated by the atmosphere. You get, you get stimulated by the architecture, by the food, uh, by the, by the um, culture. And so you try to draw that into the, into the work. Uh, for example, I've worked in Spain where I did a kind of a female Zorro um, movie, uh, uh, I should say series, called Queen of Swords. And then I worked with um, a lot of interesting uh, actors and actresses, uh, Elsa Pataki. Uh, who was in Force 5. She was a very interesting actress. She now is married to um, Chris Helmsworth, I believe. And uh, then yeah, I mentioned Paris to you as well, so that was very stimulating, you know, shooting on the Seine um, and in other places. Uh, and uh, South Africa, I really enjoyed working and living in South Africa. The people that were very friendly uh, because of the apartheid situation at the time, well, it was over, but they had been used to, to not having a lot of the equipment, let's say, that, that the other uh, countries had. And so they would jerry-rig and create creatively little, little um, pieces of equipment that you, know, you would normally have on set. And so that was very inventive. And um, it was a great wine country, great food, you know, so it was, it was interesting. And then I also worked in New Zealand. That was uh, another different experience. And I've shot in different places in the United States, you know, New York, uh, Hawaii, Um, we mentioned Miami Vice, which we shot in Florida, Mexico. Which authors in film or other arts have been influencing you? Well, um, I, um, I love Shakespeare, obviously. So I directed a little bit of Shakespeare early in my career in university and then also in, in high school, believe it or not. And then um, in terms of the filmmakers... I, uh, I love the hyphenates, the direct, director, producer, writer. So people like Billy Wilder. Uh, I love Billy Wilder. Some like it hot. He was a director that didn't get typecast. He could do drama uh, like The Apartment or he could do, you know, some like it hot. I mentioned with one of, one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, I loved Orson Welles, The Third Man. Uh, Carol Reed's movie is one of my all-time favorites. Was voted one of the best thrillers of the, of the century, if not the best, depending on what country you look at. I think it was the best in England. Um, uh, Blake Edwards, when I first came to the States, was very kind and generous to me. He was kind of a mentor to me. Here again, he was a writer, director, producer. He, uh, he could do comedy, The Pink Panther. He could also do drama, like The um, uh, Experiment in Terror, for example, which was a thriller. So I'm, I'm very much drawn to, you know, to the hyphenate uh, filmmakers. Um, uh, I don't know, in terms of authors uh, in film, I, I like William Goldman, of course. Um, but I, again, I'm, I'm drawn to the hyphenates. Which movies have inspired your vision? I would say that is my favorite movie because, first of all, it has wonderful actors in it, like um, Orson Welles and, and uh, Joseph Cotton. But I loved the setting of Old Vienna that was after the war, because that's the kind of background that my parents came from. And even though I was too young to really remember it, because I was just an infant when that movie was, uh, was, was made and I came to Canada, but the way they spoke and what they talked about Germany after the war and how it was torn up, and it was really sort of three countries divided between America, um, uh, Germany, uh, well, America, Russia, and um, Oh my goodness, what was the third one? America, Russia, and, um, well, maybe it was Germany as well. So it was kind of a, a polyglot culturally. And I love the architecture. I love the fact that um, Carol Reed used um, Dutch angles. He would make the camera uh, a little bit askew, so it made 
they make it make you feel uncomfortable and how the wide angles also not only show the geography but also if you did a close up on a wide angle that would distort the face and also you know interpret the character a different way and how you would you know stage the composition of the actor there's three or four shots with people staggered using wide shots and then I love I love the fact that I think it was wonderful that in another movie the zither the music just one instrument that played throughout the entire picture and uh, the way the film is structured you know uh, Orson Welles said that you always wanted to play an actor if you ever got a chance to to be a character that appeared in the second act but everybody spoke about you in the first act then that was a great entrance on stage so here everybody was talking about Orson Welles' character Harry Lyme was he alive was he dead you know nobody really knew and suddenly you see this cat at this guy's feet in the second act and you come up and there's Orson Welles and then one of the famous uh, you know speeches about cuckoo clocks he said you know um, how uh, uh, the uh, the swoop was had all these uh, centuries of peace, and then the the Italian culture had you know the Borgias and the Renaissance and murder and mayhem and culture and uh, what did Switzerland produce the clock with its peace? So I thought that was rather a um, kind of a funny and uh, telling uh, comment, and he improvised that. So on many many different levels, uh, I loved that movie, and it inspired me in terms of how I direct. I think, and, and this happened sort of subconsciously. I would sort of do Dutch angles and use wide angle lenses and then re- started to visit the movies I used to like again. Uh, I saw that that was present in The Third Man. Do you think it helps to watch over and over your favorite movies to discover new elements? Sure, I see something every time in, uh, in, in The Third Man. But I also love, um, I also love uh, uh, Some Like It Hot. As a, as a comedy, um, again, you know, Jack Lemmon and uh, Tony Curtis playing men that were dressed as females at the time in the late 50s. And, um, you know, the kind of conflict in the comedy that that created with them wanting Marilyn Monroe's character, Candy, I think her name was, uh, and, uh, you know, not being able to, and then reaching at the end of the movie a sense of honesty about who they were. Um, you know, was another great picture that, that's... Uh, and then I like a lot of obscure pictures that maybe a lot of people haven't heard of. I like um, I like a, a, a movie called Performance with Mick Jagger um, that was done in the 60s. And um, it was a Ukrainian movie called Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors. So, you know, in terms of contemporary pictures, um, there, are, there are some that I really love, you know, but um, they don't really come to mind. Those are the ones I kind of go back to and there's others as a screenwriter and director how much is important to develop the entire process of realization of a movie from script to film well if you're fortunate enough to to write the script and then get it produced you know to raise the money that's uh, that's really wonderful because nobody knows the story better than you do as a writer and um, um, so It's, it's really sort of the most, um, the most um, satisfying situation to come up with a character or a storyline, a theme really, what is going to be your theme, is it going to be greed, is it going to be love, is it going to be hate, is it going to be revenge, what is that going to be, and who are the characters, and then pick the main character and then have them go through, or her go through, um, the journey of the hero. And then, uh, and then of course... Uh, terms of producing it, you know, you've got to be able to sell it to the distributor in order to raise your financing or get a release. So, again, if you know the story very well, you can also incorporate certain commercial aspects in it, or even before you start writing, so that you can enable them. And as a director, you realize it, because really the script is just, just kind of a blueprint for you as a director anyway. You know, a script isn't really a piece of literature. It's really kind of a structure that you fill in with the actors and with the art director and with the cameraman and so on and so forth. So it's just, it's like a haiku, a haiku poem, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a skeleton and then you inform it. So I think the most pleasure for me is directing, but if you get a chance to, um, to, you know, to write the script, uh, then it's very, very satisfying as well. What is your definition of director? 
A director is a storyteller. You know, I think a director goes back to when we all sat around, you know, as uh, primitive people around a campfire and somebody would be telling a story. And uh, that story would captivate people. And uh, that story would have some meaning in life. Because, you know, it's easy to think of life as uh, meaningless, right? You're born, you die. There's joy, there's a lot of suffering. Why are we here? Why do we suffer? How come if we have joy, does it have to be suffering? Why do we die? Why? Um, so what art does and what storytelling does, and I think what filmmaking does, is it uh, creates meaning for people. It gives a definition of life. It gives meaning. And um, that's what I think a director is, a storyteller. Which is the difference between writing for film or for television? Writing for film, you have a lot more structure, and there's a lot less um, innovation in it, because, you know, television tends to recycle the same plots over and over and over again, and uh, they're just told in a different way with different characters, and that's fine, but there's more of a formula. In film even though there's a lot of movies being done today that are based on comic books or based on TV series or whatever. So there is a loss of, I think, that independent spirit of filmmaking that was there in the, in the 60s and in the 70s, you know. Uh, still, I think you have a greater opportunity to tell the story in a different stylistic way where you can uh, engage in um, the use of of camera lenses and art direction and wardrobe and and cutting you know sometimes in um in Bedar said this didn't he He said uh, every story has to have a beginning middle and end but not necessarily in that order so uh there's something he said for beginning a story at the end going to the going to the present uh or going to the past to, to begin the story i should say so you can do that sort of innovative filmmaking um, in, 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 the, in the film world, presumably, even though it's getting a little more difficult uh, than in television. But I think with this technology and with movies costing so much and with the Internet and whatnot and video on demand, that I, I'm hoping that there'll be a resurgence of the independent filmmaker again, because I think that's really important. I think even in the, in, even in the um, theatrical world right now, everybody, the, the movies cost so much and there's so much CGI and the return and the pressure is so great that there is an emphasis on formula. And I think uh, films are really at, at, at the most interesting is when you have um, a non-formulaic approach and you, form, you, you, you focus much more on character and you do films in a new, unusual way, which, um, you know, uh, is the uh, impetus for people to get out of their homes and out of their um, sofas and go see a theater, a movie in a theater, I should say, or on demand to see something different. Do you want to eat hamburgers all the time, or do you want to eat Thai food? I'd like to think that maybe the cinema should be more like Thai food. Which is the most challenging part of writing or rewriting a script? The writing is the most challenging. The rewriting is a lot better, because the rewriting is you realize what mistakes you've made, or where there's plot holes, or where you can create more, more conflict. And so, um, you know, the writing, the rewriting, and, I, and scripts aren't written or rewritten. I just actually sat down, and um, I'm, I'm working on a, um, on a seminar for the Willamette Writers um, Club in Portland, Oregon. And I've been asked to speak on two subjects, uh, writing from the director's point of view, and also what does a director look for in a screenplay. And as I was, um, you know, getting to know the people involved, um, they read one of my scripts, and they had some terrific ideas on how to fix it, and I've been writing and rewriting the script for about seven years. It's a difficult project to get off the ground, but it's the passion of my life, and taking their considerations into effect, I, um, I actually uh, made the script better. It's a movie called Hollywood Wolf, and it's a true story, and I think rewriting it, you should be open to it, but you should also know that you know you're going to have many different points of view, and 
I've actually written a series of blogs on my um, on my website is whether to you know re- take notes or not to take notes. That is the question. Nick Kazan, Ilya Kazan's son, wrote this article that I have in my blog where he said, you know, uh, Arthur Miller, who wrote Death of a Salesman, the classic American play, uh, when he first wrote the first draft, everybody thought it was a piece of garbage, and nobody wanted to back it. And um, and, and this was, you know, huge Broadway producers and, and, and directors didn't want to touch it. So they gave him notes, and he rewrote it, and it was garbage. And he went back to the original. You know, you never have a title with death in it. Nobody will go see a, a play with death in it, you know, and so on and so forth. And so uh, he stuck by his guns. But how many people are Arthur Miller, you know? So I think it's really important that if, if enough people say certain things about your script, you should rewrite it. And rewriting it, I think, makes it better. And rewriting it is um, more of a joy because you've got the elements in place. You've got the chess pieces on the chessboard, and it's kind of maneuvering them around to make the story much more complex and intriguing. A great tradition and love for arts is successfully bringing a third generation in your family to work in the entertainment industry. How is to work with your son, Alexander? It's fantastic. You know, as a father, you can't, I mean, what is a greater blessing than that? You know, again, I never wanted my son to be in the business. I never pushed him to be in the business because it's a brutal business. And you have to be passionate enough to suffer the rejection and the period of not working and, and so on and so forth. And, of course, there's many positive things about it, which too, the traveling, sometimes the money, and, and just the creative experience, like getting joy from creating something that didn't exist before. But you have to have that sensibility. And so I just wanted my son to have an education and, and find his own self. And then he began to make little movies, as I did. Actually, he began making little movies at a lot earlier age than I And um, so, again, you know, and then he went on and did his thing, and he was in a couple of movies, like he was in Twilight and, uh, and other films, and uh, studied very hard, and so I had an opportunity to, um, to direct him. And then um, he's also was still maintained uh, directing, and uh, he also is an entrepreneur, where, you know, his mother is a, is a stylist and a designer, and she um, studied at UCLA, Victoria. And I think he got some of her genes, obviously, because he started a company with some of his friends called Spirit Hoods, and you should go online, and they're sort of faux fur animal hats that um, create this kind of tribe feeling and express your inner uh, animal. Are you a wolf? Are you a polar bear? Are you a panda? Whatever. And so they show up in nightclubs and film, fest- uh, film festivals, you know, rock concerts, whatever, and... Um, It's kind of like belonging to a tribe. I don't know whether you've seen the, uh, the, the, uh, the hats that I'm talking about. So, you know, yeah, I've seen the website. Yeah, cool. So, you know, he's a very creative uh, young, young man. And when I did the movie The Terror Experiment that uh, Anchor Bay has just finished releasing, it was, um, it was a pleasure because we had some challenges on the show, on the movie. And uh, I would say, look, Alexander, I need these shots and need these action sequences. Can you go and just, just direct these shots and here's the set, uh, shot list. And then any other shots that you want to add to it, feel free. And he would go and do that. And I would come back and I would trust him. Plus, um, we had, again, some difficulties and we needed to recruit on the, on, on the set. And so he knew some, uh, some of his friends that had uh, gone to school with him at the American Art Institute in, uh, in Portland. Uh, and so uh, they flew down to Louisiana where we shot. And so he was basically an associate producer, um, second unit director. So it was just a thrill. You trust him. It's a joy. You know, he's a young man with his own creative sensibilities. And I can't think of anything more exciting. And we're going to be doing other projects together, too. It's by going down into the abyss that we discover the treasures of life. Where you stumble, there lies your treasure. This quote by Joseph Campbell intrinsically owns some great teachings for you. Could you tell us more about it? Sure. Again, I wish I'd come up with the quote, but I just quoted Joseph Campbell, who's a major inspiration to me. And I think people have discovered Joseph Campbell. When I say people, I mean not only you know the public, but also um, directors and producers and, and, and writers as well. And uh, Joseph Campbell was a mythologist, and he uh, influenced a lot of uh, Filmmakers such as um, uh, George Lucas, you know, who did Star Wars and uh, 
you know, a lot of the Star Wars are constructed on basically his premise that there is no new story. It's basically archetypal myths that have been handed down over the centuries, and that it's always involves the voyage of the hero, starting starting with a uh, the call to adventure, and then um, crossing a river, uh, if you will, the point of no return, and then being lost in the conflict and the trials and tribulations that you face along the way in this journey, which challenges who you were, and then ultimately coming back to your camp or your city or whatever it is, or your relationship, a changed woman or a changed man, having learned from that experience. And uh, sometimes it's, it's in uh, search of your father. If you look at um, you know, uh, Christ uh, um, searching for his father and the, the parables and the, and, and the, and the and the stories there in the Bible, or if you look at Obama's book, The Search of in the Dreams of My Father, I think it's called. So, you know, Obama went on this, uh, President Obama went on this search for his father. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the archetypal um, stories that, that man has been telling over the centuries. So, Campbell's quote about going into the abyss is going into the unknown. We should, we should uh, welcome the challenge to be challenged, to leave the comfort of our daily lives and go on to that call of adventure, which is scary and which is frightening and which has trials and tribulations. But ultimately, if we face our fear, which is really what every hero does, I don't care if it's a Western or a sci-fi movie or, or a love relationship, if you face your fear and go through it, then... You come out of the abyss, if you will, that area of fear and doubt, and you become wiser for it. And that is the ingredient of every story, more or less. And, um, you know, it's something we apply in our lives. It's not just something in myths come from everyday lives. We go through that abyss and that journey of the hero in our daily lives when we wake up in the morning in a decade we go through it in a in a year we go through it over the course of our lives and i think that on our society especially in the western world i think in the western society we're afraid of getting old and we're afraid of death and we're afraid of all, all you know so many different things and so what we do is we try to fight that it's as, it's as if, if we have plastic surgery and we you know, deny that, that, that much of life involves suffering. And through suffering, there's growth. You know, there's no real growth unless you suffer. Um, and I know some people will think, well, that's kind of morbid, but it's not. It's true, you know, because people get sick, people die, you know, people get injured, people get in accidents, people's relationships break up, you know. Suffering and how you deal with it, it you know, creates growth. And we try to eliminate that in life in the Western world. But if you embrace it, then I think you grow, and there's something heroic in that. And I think that's what I was trying to say by quoting um, Joseph Campbell. That's true. Somehow, every one of us can be the hero on his journey if we get the courage to see our true self. That's exactly Every one of us is a hero if we embrace going on this journey that everybody gets the call to go on. And here's the point. You know, just because we deny it, and say it doesn't exist doesn't mean that we don't suffer. It just means or that we, you know, don't go through this call to adventure. It just means that we don't grow as much as we are given the opportunity to, you know, because I think it's very important to, uh, to you know, where your greatest fear is, if you go through it, that's where your bliss is. That's where you come out um, a hero. Catharsis, right? Yes. Could you tell us about the mythology aspects and the voyage of the hero in the terror experiment? Well, um, the terror experiment is really a genre movie. It's not a, it's not a particularly serious piece. It kind of is a new slam on zombie movies. But it basically, the, 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 hero, uh, the hero's journey there is uh, Jason London played um, uh, Kale. Kale is a boring computer geek that works in a uh, federal building. And an explosion happens. And uh, what happens is that this gas is released. 
and uh, his daughter is in a nursery on the fourth floor, and he has to get to her to, to, to rescue her. But the gas, it turns out to be this warfare gas that the government has been secretly uh, creating, um, and it makes people either very hyper-aggressive or very passive. And so they turn into kind of zombie-like creatures. Their adrenaline, their adrenal glands get very stimulated. And so the, he has to fight through that to get the saber. And so he goes through a journey because at the end he kind of becomes an action hero in a way by dealing with these crazed people that have become uh, tainted. And um, he, um, I'm not going to tell you how it ends, but he, it's a heroic journey where he becomes a different person than when he went to work that day. And it happens on, on Christmas, uh, during the Christmas season. So it's kind of um, um, symbolic in the sense that you've got this uh, uh, hero going through this metamorphosis, um, if you will, this sort of rebirth um, as a character. But I don't want to put too much into it because hopefully you can look at certain things and you can just say, oh, okay, there might be this subtext, I think it's really important for every movie to have some type of subtext, especially a genre picture. And more importantly, it's just a, a popcorn muncher, you know, not to be taken too seriously, um, you know, to be enjoyed. You have a great passion for sound mixing too. How did this apply to the terror experiment or other movies? Well, you know, I wish I had more money to have worked on the terror experiment to really do the mix that I wanted to do, but it did give me some opportunities in creating uh, the sound of the uh, of the zombies, you know, because we, we put different animal sounds together with human sounds and we created this special sound that hopefully sounded different than, than in other zombie movies or that we would have had otherwise if we didn't do it in post. And, uh, you know, music is very important as well, or non-music is very important. I don't think that... Um, the terror experiment necessarily again because a budget reflects um, uh, the sound design that I would have wanted to let's put it that way but um, I do think sound design is critical again if you go to a movie like Blow Up with uh, uh, David Hemmings whom I knew and it was done by Antonio Muni uh, an Italian filmmaker which I'm sure you're very familiar with in the 60s there is a wonderful scene, several wonderful scenes, where uh, David Hemmings, who thinks he found a dead body in a park, who thinks he witnessed a, a murder because he was filming something that was models or uh, fashion, some sort of fashion shots, and then when he went and he went into the, the dark room, he blew them, blew them up and realized, wait a minute, maybe I shot a murder without really realizing it. And there's a wonderful scene where he goes back to try to find the body, to see if he's crazy or not. And if you look at that movie, and I've been re-watching it because I'm going to be talking about it in my seminar, there's no music. There's none of this dun 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 The kind of thing that you would think would create this auto, uh, artificial, in a sense, um, tension or jeopardy or whatever. All you do is hear wind. Just rustling through the leaves. And it's so scary. And all he used was just, you know, sound effects of, 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 of uh, wind blowing through the leaves. And if you think that's an easy sound effect to create, believe me, there are so many different wind sounds out there. But very few are as scary and as lyrical and as um, foreboding as that just juxt juxtaposition of that sound of the wind and the leaves with the park. And then on the other hand, we have movies like um, Miami, series like Miami Vice, where the music was so important. And you get that old fact that you had Phil Collins, you know, singing and, you know, Sheena Easton and other people as well. And great actors. So... You have to, as a director, pick what you're going to do to really tell your story effectively. And sometimes the obvious isn't the way to go. And sometimes because of time or genre or whatever, the obvious is the way to go. So sitting there when you don't have to worry about the sun going down and not getting your shots or the schedule, although you do have a post-schedule, of course, but just being alone in a dark theater with your mixer and you've already worked on the soundtrack with your composer, and you've already worked with the sound effects people, and then how you create that. Sometimes you say, you know what, I don't want a music here. I just want the effects. Or sometimes, you know, let's lose the effects. Or, um, again, you know, film, uh, to, to state the obvious, is a visual medium. Sometimes you don't want dialogue. 
sometimes you want just a scene. I did a scene in, um, which I'm, again, I'm going to have in my lecture on a series called, for show called uh, Street Time with Rob Morrow and, um, and some other people, uh, some other talented actors, and Richard Stratton was the executive producer. And um, there was a scene where one of the main actors was looking through a window and he saw his parolee. He was a parole officer, Rob Moore parolee. And his wife drives up in a car in front of the restaurant. And he doesn't know, Rob Morrow's character doesn't know that um, the parole officer is sitting there watching this. And she gets the suitcase out. I mean, actually, not even a suitcase. It was a bag of clothes. And she starts throwing the clothes at him. And she throws the bag in his face. And she's yelling. You don't really hear what she's saying. But she gets in the car and drives off in the rain with him with his clothes and his underwear standing in the street. Well, what do you think that scene means? She left him, right? She ended the relationship. She humiliated him, but you don't need a dialogue. You don't need to, I hate you and you cheated on me and I'm going to leave you and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and here's your toothpaste, you know, you just see it. And and, uh, so sometimes sound or dialogue is not important. In fact, I would think dialogue is the least important in many ways. Creating an atmosphere and a mood through music, or not, through sound effects, not, you know, is what you have to work with as a filmmaker in, in cinema. Sometimes sound is not just an atmosphere, but another character on the scene. Absolutely, sure. That's a good way of putting it. I would agree with that. George, you and your son Alexander are a great team. Which are your current or future projects? Well, actually, we're meeting on the phone tomorrow because he lives in Los Angeles. Um, and um, we're going to meet on the phone and we're going to talk about some of the projects because he's bringing projects to me. I'm bringing projects to him. And we just have to identify. Obviously, Hollywood Wolf is one. Um, I'd like to work with Anchor Bay as a distributor, so we're going to bring some projects to them and also to other distributors, and we'll see what we get off the ground. There's also um, there's a sci-fi project that I'm interested in. It's kind of a lyrical uh, project that deals with the ocean. I don't want to get too elaborate about it because I don't want to get the idea to get ripped off, to be honest with you. But there's that, and there's this period uh, love story called Hollywood Wolf, and there's other projects that he's also bringing to me. So... We're going to just work together and, and find one that we're passionate about and, and, and realize it. That's beautiful. So we will really look forward to your upcoming works. You'll be the first to know. How's that? That sounds great. Isha, you'll be the first to know. How's that? Absolutely great. So listen, George, would you like to remind our followers how can they visit your website? It's www.georgemendeluk.com. And there you're going to have uh, my reels, the different samples of the work that I've done, my resume, interviews with me, the blogs that I write, certainly two or three times a month. Uh, and it talks about you know, many of the things we discussed here and different things about writing, about directing. And uh, you know, I've been in the business for 42 years, and it kind of sneaks up on you. I never realized I've been directing in, 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 the, in the film business as long as I have. But one day you wake up and you go, wait a minute, have I been doing this this long? And... That's where I'm at at this stage of my journey. Listen, George, thank you so much for joining us. It was really a pleasure to have you on our show. And uh, we'll be delighted to know more about you and your work very soon. Okay, thank you very much for having me. And I wish you all the best as well in the future. Thank you.